Hi everybody, it's John Pushkar, and I'm here today with another episode from the world of fuels and combustion equipment safety. Today, I've got episode two of my 20 hazards presentation. Today, we're going to cover items six through 10. So sit back, relax, remember, take good notes, email me if you have any questions. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. And something else to add to that equipment startup protocol is that you shouldn't be standing there trying to start something over and over and over again. In fact, when it comes to fired equipment, I recommend no more than two startup attempts without getting some help. And here's why. Every time you hit the startup button, there's a burner management system shown here as the blue box, which manages the light off process. And it first looks at all of the safety devices to make sure that they're in a position or in a condition where things can move forward with the light off process. And the first thing it does after checking everything out is it tells a fan to start and a timer goes off with that fan. It asks for a certain amount of airflow to be circulated through the firebox to dilute and flush out any flammables that might be in there. This is called the pre-purge process. Once the pre-purge process is over, gas valves open and a spark igniter takes over. And we're trying typically to light a pilot system. If we've successfully lit a pilot system, then we have the same thing happen with larger gas valves on the main fuel train. We attempt to light the main burner. So I hope you understand that every time we hit the start button, well, gas is getting released into the firebox for up to 10 seconds at a time, both to try to light the pilot system and to light the main flame system. If they don't happen to light, we have this purge process I talked about that's supposed to flush air through the firebox. But you know what? Sometimes there are things that happen like fan blades are dirty. Somebody changed the timer so that it's not running for long enough. There's lots of things that can happen to compromise that purge process. And if that purge process were compromised and you were trying to light off over and over and over again, you see what starts to happen here. We start to accumulate a lot of gas in the firebox. This little diagram shows the range of flammability for natural gas. And it shows you here that natural gas will ignite when it reaches a volume in air of only 4.3% of the total mixture. That's called the lower explosive limit or LEL of natural gas. And if we would accumulate this in the firebox and start that spark igniter, we would ignite that mixture all at once and have a horrible catastrophic explosion like what happened at this office building in Pontiac, Michigan. Another hazard we should be aware of is backdrafting of flue products in a piece of combustion equipment like the boiler shown on the left or the hot water heater shown on the right and the generation of CO or carbon monoxide. If we're not getting flue products out of the facility and they contain a lot of CO, you can understand very bad things could happen. Because when the combustion process is not occurring properly, we can make a lot of different things when we rearrange all the molecules involved. We can make alcohol, ammonia, formaldehyde, sometimes just black speck, soot, carbon comes out of the flu. All of these things are surrogate indicators that we're making carbon monoxide. It means the combustion process, well, it's not going as planned. If we do get carbon monoxide into the breathing space, it's odorless and tasteless. People may react to a funny smell, but that smell would be from some of these other compounds that we created. So you have to be aware that if people are complaining of eyes red, sinus reactions, uh, maybe their glasses are fogging up or there's moisture dripping from windows, 
All of those are indicators that we could be backdrafting and we could be putting materials from the flu products into the space that are not very healthy and probably contain a lot of CO. Now, the really bad problem with carbon monoxide is that it's cumulative in the bloodstream. So day one, you may feel some nausea or dizziness or have a headache. Day two, you might be stumbling around and feeling lethargic as heck and wondering if you can even get up out of your chair. Day three, you might be laying in the corner of your office hoping somebody would find you. And there's an especially bad problem when it comes to naturally drafted equipment. This is equipment that doesn't have a fan forcing the flu products through the combustion chamber. This is typical, for example, of many residential hot water heaters, where we're just relying on a density difference of the hot air going up, inducing cold air to come back into the combustion chamber at the bottom. In fact, NFPA 54, the National Fuel Gas Code, it says that it could take up to five minutes to establish draft. That's the actual suction and removal of the materials that are being combusted. It tells you to do a draft check after five minutes. The implication is, is that you could have flu products dumping out into the space for at least five minutes while things are getting warmed up and becoming functional as a flu system. It's important to do draft checks and make sure that your system is drafting properly and that you're not bringing a lot of these materials back into the space. Every manufacturer provides information on how to do a draft check for their equipment. It's relatively simple. But what about if you do a draft check and it's not drafting properly? Well, quite often it's because there's lots of exhaust on in the facility that's in excess of the amount of air coming in. There may be louvers provided to bring in combustion air. Those louvers may not be functional. They may be clogged with debris. Solving combustion air and draft problems, well, they can be kind of tricky. If you have a problem like this, it could occur intermittently, could occur with different weather conditions. It's time to get a professional involved. And just how bad could it get? Well, I happen to have been deposed a couple of months ago on this particular horrible incident that occurred in Beaumont, Texas at an elementary school. In fact, there were close to 200 people impacted when carbon monoxide in a mechanical equipment room got distributed through an air handler in a building and made lots of people sick. If you're in responsible charge or know of a mechanical equipment room that has naturally drafted equipment and has air handlers, please make sure that you've got a carbon monoxide detector in that room that reports to somewhere where people would know if there was a problem. In fact, now in the state of Texas, it's law that these be installed. Another thing you've got to be looking for is burned paint, warped spots on the outside of boilers or hot water heaters, spots that might be obviously hot when the equipment is running. These are all signs that the refractory is starting to fail. And what's refractory? Well, refractory is the material that protects the steel in any kind of combustion equipment. The steel actually forms the structure and it forms the outside casing that keeps everything together and makes it a functional piece of fired equipment. And there are many different types and styles of refractory like I'm showing you here. One of the more common problems that leads to the failure of refractory is folks that start things up very quickly or cool things down very quickly. You see, carbon steel and rock, which is basically a lot of ceramic refractory, they don't expand and contract at nearly the same rates. So if you heat something up too quick, the steel outstretches the ceramic material, fractures it, you then get hot flue gases in, behind the refractory and it starts to degrade the steel very rapidly. Part of the consequences of not dealing with refractory issues quickly are that the costs, the scope of work, and the downtime, well, they go up exponentially the longer you wait. 
Another thing to be on the lookout for is dangerous flame conditions. For standard run-of-the-mill burners, you should have a nicely formed blue cone with little yellow or orange flickers coming off. If it's low NOx, low nitrogen oxide specialty burner for emissions, might be a completely different looking flame. I'm trying to give you the general case here. Part of what we have to talk about is how to look and where to look. So there should be sight ports provided. Typically there's one at the front of the burner which allows you to see that the flame is lit. That's not where you gather the most important information and you should never be trying to watch a light off. You get the most useful information when the flames are coming at you and you could safely observe them. Typically through some type of a sight port that has special tempered glass on it and you would first check it when the equipment is down to make sure it doesn't have any holes in it then only with the proper PPE like safety glasses maybe flame resistant clothing would you bend down and look through that lens and again never watching the light off. There have been a number of people injured trying to watch light offs Oftentimes when there's an accumulation like we talked about when you try to start many times and an explosion it could severely damage if not kill you when that sight port self-destructs in your face. So what are we looking for? We're looking for colors. Remember I talked about nice blue with little yellow orange flickers not real pale blue sharp edged noisy that indicates that it's too lean. Likewise, not bright yellow or orange, smoky, lazy, rolling around. That typically indicates a too rich condition. Also, if it's round, it should be symmetrically lit evenly all the way around. The flame should be near the face of the burner, shouldn't be pulled off the burner. The burner should not be damaged. The flame should not be driving into a sidewall or into boiler tubes. If you see something like the lower right here where the bottom part of this is orange, it's not a symmetrical looking nice even consistent pattern here. That could be because there's actual impingement going on where there's actually a flame laying on part of the burner. You see impingement is a direct steady driving of a flame on some surface. A lick is when it occasionally goes out and touches something. If you see any of these conditions, I'm not suggesting you try to repair them yourself. Adjusting burners and getting the right mixtures throughout the firing range requires a special skill level and equipment. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit. I told you there's two paths we'd examine. Let's now take a look at hazards related to piping systems. Never work on energized piping systems. By energized, we typically mean that there's some type of energy in there. Could be pressure, could be a chemical energy, but you should never be working on energized piping systems. What do I mean by working on them? Well, sometimes it's a, it's a very simple, innocent type of thing that you think you're doing. Maybe there's a little bit of a leak and you figure, oh, I'm just going to go tighten that bolt a little bit. I don't feel like taking it out of service. My God, I've got to then disturb everyone. We've got to talk about it. We're going to go out of production. People will be mad. There have been catastrophic losses of life by people just trying to tighten a bolt. You can see here in the pictures that I'm showing you, gaskets that have blown out of flanged connections. This can happen very easily by trying to tighten a bolt where there's not much gasket surface left, all of a sudden you compromise a little bit of gasket that was there, and you've got second and third degree burns all over your hand, your face, or your chest. Oh, and it could be much worse. There are a number of different type of metallurgical failure mechanisms that can occur that you can't see. You have just no way to know that they've occurred. The simple ones are erosion or corrosion, inside of piping systems, but there's another mechanism called creep failure. This is where you've got long-term low-level stresses and high temperatures. When this occurs, we change the metallurgical structure over time. 
little cracks occur, if those little cracks have been lining up for some period of time, and you're the guy who grabs that valve handle and really tries to force it, or takes a couple of big wrenches and really tries to tighten, or tries to adjust a pipe hanger, could be that one last event that makes all the cracks line up and makes for a complete random disassembly of that piping system or valve bonnet. It's happened many times over and over again. And it's just not something you need to be a part of. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.